Thank you so much for being here. This evening is jointly co-hosted by the Illinois Humanities Council and the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. The school project is indeed special, looking into the history, philosophical underpinning, and controversy surrounding standardized testing. It's also a truly unprecedented collaboration with Free Spirit Media, Cartemquin Films, Kindling Group, Media Process Group, Siskel Jacobs Productions, and producers Rachel Dixon and Melissa Stern. They were all partners in this film. Thank you so much for being here. We look forward to a great event. Thank you, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I'm Bob Hercules. I'm uh, one of the co-executive producers of the School Project series. The other uh, co-executive producer is Gordon Quinn, who's right there from Cartem Quinn Films. Uh, you, some of you may know we've been working on this series now, really, I think since March of 2013. So it's been a uh, very interesting uh, investigation into uh, the school issues. And I thank everybody for coming. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to say a couple things. Uh, we're, first of all, I wanted to thank the Illinois Humanities Council and DCASE, uh, their collaborative city project, for having us, for sponsoring this event. We also want to thank the Cultural Center. Uh, it's always great to be at the Cultural Center because it's such an amazing building, and it's just a great place to be. We love this theater. Uh, as Michelle said, the, our production partners on this are Free Spirit Media, Cartemquin Films, Kindling Group, Media Process Group, Siskel Jacobs Productions, and independent producers uh, Melissa Stern and Rachel Dixon. Um, we also have a, what we did on this project was we put together a bunch of outreach partners, so it's a little unusual collaboration. So I also want to acknowledge our outreach partners. They're the ones who are helping to amplify our series through their various distribution channels. And they are WTTW Channel 11, who will be running the segment, or maybe they already did, I'm not sure. Uh, the Chicago Sun-Times, Catalyst Chicago, the Chicago History Museum, Ebony.com, the Community Media Workshop, StoryCorps, and thanks to Can TV for carrying this event live. So if uh, your friends can't be here, but they want to see it, they could actually go on Can TV right now and watch the watch what we're doing right now live. Uh, they can also go to cantv.org to watch the program later if they want, so either way. Uh, I also just want to remind you that our, our own website uh, is uh, schoolprojectfilm.com and we'll have all our segments on that website. And uh, let's see, finally, I want to thank our funders uh, for making this all possible the Richard Driehaus Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, the Chicago Digital Media Production Fund, a program of Chicago filmmakers, and the Vocal Fund. So thank you for all our funders. And now, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, the producer of tonight's segment, Melissa Stern. Thank you. Hello. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. Um, so this is a short segment, testing season. And it's designed to start a conversation. I know right now is testing season in public schools all over the country. And we're hoping that this will spark conversations, get a discussion going. And during, uh, we, want to, we want you to share your thoughts. Um, there's going to be a question and answer afterwards. And you can tweet your questions to hashtag the school project or go online to School Project, make your voice heard, um, and make your voice heard. Let us know what you think. Um, and that's it, enjoy the film. To test or not to test. At a rally in Harlem, signs read more teaching, less testing. From the Pacific Northwest to the Lone Star State, educators are saying enough is enough. Thousands of parents are opting their kids out of the test. It is strictly about data and dollars. It's March 2014, and Chicago parents and teachers are planning a citywide opt-out of the upcoming state test. 
Okay, it's not just about this ISAT. It's about the insane amount of testing that our kids are subjected to every single year. First it was the ITBS, the Iowa test, and then the ISAT. Now we're doing NWA, we do Dibbles, we do Benchmark. So it's just really about pushing back on the unjust over-testing that's hurting our students. I had one student actually pull out his eyelashes from stress. And also, frankly, they're not indicators of what they actually know. Student assessment is an integral part of school. Teachers do it all day long through observation, assigning homework and projects, and creating tests to cover what they've taught in class. Standardized tests are one type of assessment and are usually developed by testing companies and given to thousands of students. And because they're all taking the same test, you can compare the results across students at many different schools, often different districts, sometimes different states. They give me the data that I need to build curriculum around what I need children to know. Without that, I'm just whistling in the wind. We're so used to multiple choice tests. Well, the, the genesis of that goes way back to 1917, and it had to do with meeting a need that the Army had with respect to selecting individuals for different jobs and different roles in the military. And that actually began the large-scale use of standardized tests. And then that just led into uses in the educational arena, including developing further intelligence and aptitude tests, but also in developing tests of academic achievement. Where things really changed dramatically in terms of the use of standardized achievement tests came in with the No Child Left Behind law in 2002. It's time to come together to get it done. The intent of No Child Left Behind was to ensure that every public school student received the same quality of education. Schools would be held accountable through yearly standardized tests given to students in grades three through eight, with scores broken down for various demographic groups. The stakes were high. Rewards would go to schools whose test scores improved. Schools that didn't show adequate yearly progress could lose federal funding. With No Child Left Behind, we moved into the era of high stakes accountability. And that's where we've been suffering from the unintended consequences that we've developed an entire industry around testing. We have stretched the purposes of testing well beyond what they were intended to do, which was to measure a narrow band of student achievement. On top of the yearly state test mandated by No Child Left Behind, Chicago, like many school districts, requires additional standardized tests using the scores as part of a complex algorithm to determine everything from access into top-ranked schools to teacher evaluations and school ratings. So test scores account for a little bit more than half of what we call the school quality rating policy. But that's down from our prior uh, measurement and especially across the country we feel like it's uh, either in line or a little bit lower than many of the other accountability systems that you see. When you have high stakes associated with a test it puts pressure on people to perform well and that can be a good thing but it also puts pressure on people to do bad practices to maybe cheat on the test or to narrow the curriculum so that they're only testing subjects that are tested on the test. The goal of every school now is to get higher test scores. So you, our schools are really just test score factories. That is just the opposite of what education should be. A lot of the standardized tests we take in class don't have anything to do with the, the curriculum that we're learning. They don't have anything to do with our grades. And a lot of the times they're just for teacher or school evaluations. The kids themselves start seeing a, a school not as something that is a natural environment for them, but, but as, as a job, as a duty. So it kills the love of learning. And really, truly, as teachers, our purpose, our intent should always be to increase in them that love of learning. Most testing is just in reading and math and yet we are using that to draw conclusions about the entirety of a student's performance, their aptitude in the arts, in physical education, and history, and science. We're tying those measures to principal performance, to school performance. We're using those as the basis of making 
financial decisions, for bonuses, for pay raises, and this creates a set of perverse incentives that it's not about what's in the interest of the student, but it's now what's in the interest of the adult. I'm glad they've tied assessment to evaluation because each of us have a job to do and you are held accountable for doing your job. And if you're not being held accountable for assessment, what are you being held accountable for? There are ways to get evidence about student achievement that don't require us to constantly do this drop, what we call drop in from the sky once a year assessment. In many cases, in many countries, they get evidence that comes from examples of classroom work. And you can do it in a standardized way. We're just sort of tied to the standardized test, partly because, and this is a very important issue, we don't trust our teachers. They're using these tests and these scores to close our schools. They're using them to fire good experienced teachers. And frankly, the data is not accurate. And it happens that the scores are low where the poorest kids live. The most obvious way to predict which schools will have low scores is a combination of two factors, poverty and racial segregation. What we've shown in our work here is that a test is one part of a larger body of work, multiple measures that will be used to develop a picture and an assessment of what a student knows, how a teacher is performing, where a principal is providing good leadership, and then what that school ultimately does for kids. Last year we went from 25 tests down to 10, an elimination of 15 standardized tests. This year for the first time in the uh, public opinion polls, the Gallup poll, uh, something like 70% said there's too much testing. Uh, we, we don't trust it, we don't like it. As a parent, I believe I have the right to guide the education of my son. Dozens of parents of CPS students say the standardized test called the ISET is nothing but a waste of time. Opt-out has been something that's growing here in Chicago and across the country. Uh, we didn't really know how big it was gonna be last year. We just knew that, you know, here's this test, the ISET, it's going away, it's not gonna be high stakes for anyone. So we ended up, I think, having about 2,000 students last year opt out. So I opted out of my ISAT test and, and it, it totally worked. Each time people would come up to me kind of a little more interested, like, oh, okay, so why is it that you don't take these tests? Oh, is that, okay. Oh, you have a, you have a packet here with information? Okay, I'll take that home to my mom. Like, what it's important to know is the protests last year were only in a very, very few number of schools, involved a very, very few number of students. But what it did was it got our attention, and it's helped us focus more, I think, on how we message, how we get that out there, so that people can understand that especially with the coming tests with Park, we're going to be part of something larger, and that where we move the work forward is by focusing on Common Core, focusing on a higher level of instruction and a greater level of rigor, and then testing that with a new set of tests that have high expectations. Illinois began administering the new PARC test in March 2015. Amid concerns that the test was not ready for such wide-scale use, CPS had asked the State Board of Education for permission to only test 10% of students. The board denied that request, saying that unless it was administered across the district, they would withhold all state funds, $1 billion or more. This decision prompted many parents to organize against the park test. This year we're also trying now to actually get some strong legal clarity on opt-out by passing a law in Illinois that says parents have the right to opt their children out. We do know from the research that if teachers use assessment close to instruction, to make judgments about how their students are learning and then act on that information because it's diagnostic, then learning goes up. We are way out of balance in the sense that very little goes to supporting the teacher in the classroom in the ongoing process of instruction. I think just educating parents more and more about what high quality education should look like can really make a difference. I think that um, there will be more discussion about testing. When the Seattle teachers boycotted, the discussion started, and, and there were great results from that. Um, hopefully there'll be something similar here. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful.
so we're about to get our panel started, but before I do, I want to recognize the public officials who've joined us tonight. Um, we have State Representative Will Gazzardi from the 39th District. <laughs> and Committeeman Raymond Lopez of the 15th Ward. <laughs> and have I, missed, have I missed anyone else? Uh, thank you for coming out, and thank you for your support of the school project. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Linda Lenz, our moderator. Um, Linda is the founder and publisher of Catalyst Chicago, which has been reporting on school reform in Chicago since 1990. Congratulations on your 25th anniversary. Um, Linda has also won numerous awards for her writing, her, her editing and reporting, including the Studs Terkel Community Media Award. And she's also the former president of the National Education Writers Association. And Linda and Catalyst have been wonderful partners for us in the school pro um, project and an invaluable source of, of invaluable resource. So thank it's you. It's been great for us too, thanks. thanks. Why don't the panelists come, come up, and I'll learn to speak right into the microphone. Um, and while they are, actually, have you been told what your order is? Oh, we need to get it right for CAN TV. So why don't you come up, and Susan, you're sitting next to me. And then there's Cassie, and Juan, and Mary, and Dahlia. And as you're getting settled, um, in case there's someone in this room who isn't thoroughly immersed in this topic, just a few words of setup, which I think you, know, you will have seen in the film. Testing is a complicated topic. It weaves in and out of all sorts of other issues from you know, whether we trust teachers, as Jim Pellegrino talked about, to whether your kids can get into an elite school. And I've detected a range of opinions about um, standardized testing, like from ranging from you should get rid of it entirely, to you keep it, but you cut it back, you keep it, but you cut back the stakes, and there are, are a variety of things there. Um, it's particularly complicated now because we are moving from a state-only test, um, the ISAT, into a multi-state test called the PARC. Uh, and just about everybody agreed that the old tests were not very good. They didn't set standards that were very high, and people got the impression that their kids were doing really well, even on more basic skills, when they were not necessarily uh, doing that much better. Um, and it's adding to the confusion, too, is that we're now switching to an online administration of the test. So there is just a whole lot of stuff going on here. Um, and my personal goal is to understand sort of what the options are and what the implications are. And so I'm going to start by uh, giving uh, a, a stand to see who's in favor of it and get some discussion going around that particular stand. But first, let me introduce the panelists. Susan Goldman, she's co-director of UIC, University of Illinois Chicago's Learning Sciences Research Institute and a distinguished professor of psychology and education in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. She's a recipient of a long list of honors, appointments, and distinctions, which you can read about in the program. Uh, she conducts research on subject matter learning, instruction, assessment, and on roles of technology and literacy in, um, and especially in literacy and math. Okay, Cassie is um, a founding organizer of More Than a Score, a coalition of parents, teachers, and community members fighting against the misuse and overuse of standardized testing in CPS. She's on the board of Raise Your Hand, a Chicago-wide public education advocacy parent group, and she is a parent of a third grader and a preschooler school, formerly in CPS and now enrolled in the private Waldorf schools. Juan Gonzalez, very interesting background. Uh, degrees in electrical engineering <laughs> and liberal arts, got into the Peace Corps, taught high school mathematics in Benin, um, for two years, went through a program back home at DePaul University, ended up in CPS where he has been for 24 years, teaches at Drummond Elementary. Mary Fergus, um, she's the spokesperson at the Illinois State Board of Education, and we do keep her busy. Uh, prior to joining ISBE, Mary was an award-winning reporter at uh, Chicago Tribune and the Houston Chronicle, where she wrote about everything under the sun, including education. And we seem to be moving back toward that as well, unfortunately. And uh, finally, Dahlia Flores, who is lifelong educator, teacher, principal, network, and district administrator. She's deputy chief of staff to Chicago Public Schools CEO Barbara Bird Bennett. Before that, she was on the CPS 
um, Office of Teaching and Learning, where she helped uh, develop the interdisciplinary Latino and Latin American studies curriculum. So thank you all for joining us. Um, is there anyone here who would get rid of standardized testing and completely? Well, I guess I'm a little bit surprised. I'd expected a hand to go up. Um, what about uh, keeping the standardized tests but cutting back on the, you know, amount of time spent on them? Okay, we have one, two, three, yeah, more or less. Well, tell me about the more or less. What are you thinking? And speak into your microphone, please. Well, I think that um, the issue of standardized testing is just the tip of the iceberg. It really needs to be seen in the context of what the goals of education are and how we're trying to get there and the role that we see for um, the wisdom of practice that teachers bring to the uh, classroom and the needs and assessments that they make on an ongoing basis are just as much about assessment. It's not quote standardized, but it's very close to instruction. And as Jim Pellegrino said, uh, the closer it is to instruction, the more useful the information for tailoring instructional experiences to what a student needs. So I think that when you talk about assessment, you have to understand the functions and purposes for which it's being used, and then suit the sort of assessment instrument to that purpose. And how would you use standardized testing? I think that there are reasonable accountability measure at some level, but the level is not necessarily at the level of the student. It may be more at a systems level or even a school level, but we don't necessarily have to test every child every year in math and writing to, in, and uh, reading to, to know that. Okay, Mary, how does the state, well, how does the state react to that? Well, the state would say that, you know, right now the federal government does require uh, us to test students through third grade, through third through eighth grade and once, at least once in high school. And, you know, as, as the film said, it, it really became um, more common during No Child Left Behind. It was required before that, but it frankly wasn't done very well. And um, with all the problems with No Child Left Behind, the one good thing that it did was it put a laser sharp focus on how all students were doing. And the state would, you know, my bosses and, and our board members would say they want to keep that focus. Um, they want to ensure that we're still testing all students because otherwise we won't know how they're doing. And in the past, we saw that some groups were hidden and we weren't clear how well students with disabilities or students in poverty or Latino students or African American students were doing. We didn't talk about the achievement gap and we didn't certainly talk about trying to narrow the gap and that's a conversation that we've had in the past 10 years and that we're still wrestling with. We're still trying to figure out how to um, narrow that gap but we um, we need that data to be able to track that. We all need to ensure that all students have access to uh, the same education and that we're reporting that performance. Dahlia, what, what does CPS want standardized test data for? Okay, I thought I was uh, answering the question with regards to well, um, el you know eliminating the amount of testing. Go ahead, go for it. So, so for that one first, I think that um, you know, echoing what both of um, the panelists have said with regards to mean, you know meaningful tests that are aligned to the types of instructional experiences that students are experiencing in the classroom is important. Being able to um, hold ourselves accountable to the results and to the growth um, in students' education is critically important as well. I think there is an opportunity always to be reflective and responsive. Um, so that we can eliminate any overlap and any unnecessary testing. And I think that that's something that we're um, definitely looking at with regards to transitioning from NWA and PARC um, and just ensuring that, yes, we need to have a pulse on how students are, are learning. That data is extremely valuable for teachers to make determinations on instruction. I assessed my students all the time. It wasn't always paper pencil. Sometimes it was through, you know, anecdotal things, observations. You know, you're constantly keeping a pulse, and and in order to respond and you know adjust your teaching or adjust a strategy. And so I think we would definitely look more to being reflective and trying to eliminate any overlap and any unnecessary testing. 
So is NWEA going away? I'm sorry? Is NWEA going away? <laughs> we haven't made that decision yet. Okay. Um, yeah, talk about a use of tests in the classroom. Oh. There we go. There you go. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to just hit on a word that you say, uh, uh, reflecting, reflection. Um, most important when it comes to any kind of assessment. Um, and uh, then I'm gonna put it out there that in order to reflect, you need time. And um, I'm not talking about a short amount of time. You need time enough so that whatever it is that you did, you can take a look at it and you can make good sense of it. Um, I argue that we overtest our kids way too much. Um, my uh, middle school team and I, we were sitting uh, this week trying to plan for, for, for May, uh, and um, we just couldn't do justice to our kids because in the month of May, we have Park Part Two coming up, we have the Rich uh, Assessment coming up, we have um, um, Algebra Exit Exam, and we have NWEA MAP Test. Um, we were trying to give a break our to, to our kids between one test and the other. We couldn't find the time. Seriously, at Apple, yeah, some of my kids are here right now. Your, your month of May is going to be full of tests. Um, I wash my hands of those tests. Um, now, my position in testing is the following. Um, I believe that we should move to um, grade span testing. So. What we do, instead of every kid every year, we test kids um, once in uh, um, three to fifth grade. Let's not start young. Let's not do kindergarten, first, second grade. Seriously, that is just unfair and, um, and almost cruel to those little guys. Um, so spend testing once three to five, once six to nine, one ten to twelve, one time. Now, what do I want those tests to do? I don't want them to be high stakes. Really, seriously, to, 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 to take that one test and make it so important so that um, our kids' future depends almost literally on that one day, how they perform, it is, uh, it is, it is so, uh, it, it is so uh, uh, unrealistic, it's so unfair to, 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 to our kids. Um, it needs to be a standardized test that guides instruction. The only purpose for assessment should be to guide instruction. It should not be to hold teachers accountable. Let's find a better way to do that, people. By the way, that statement out there about trusting teachers, you know what, you gotta do that. Um, I've been doing some reading. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but as a system of education in the United States, we actually have been improving over the last, uh, since 1971, which, which is when the first time the NAEP test was given out. Um, uh, our, our performance has been improving steadily. We are right now at the highest performance that we've ever had since that time. So, chew on that. Yeah, as I said, it weaves in and out of all sorts of issues. Okay, Cassie, what would you do with standardized testing? I would say, I don't think I would say outright we have to eliminate every single bit, um, but I would say that a key problem with the quantity that we're seeing, with the lack of time for other things that it's pushing out, uh, is because of the stakes that are attached to the tests. The fact that we have these high stakes decisions about students, about teachers, about schools, and that is really what is driving the amount of testing, the amount of time on test prep, the narrowing of the curriculum, pushing uh, these inappropriate levels of academics down into K through two, and it's really those uh, the accountability things that are attached to the test. So unless we fix that, I think even grade span testing would not necessarily relieve the pressure that we've seen on, you know, especially the teaching profession. Um, and so, you know, I think really for almost any purpose that we're using standardized testing right now, there is a better method and better techniques and better tools that have a better cost benefit ratio. Uh, and unfortunately, we can't even explore those. Give, give an example of, of a tool. Um, so say evaluating how a school is doing. Uh, there's numerous countries around the world where you have a panel of experts that come and observe and speak with the professionals in the school, speak with the students, families, and put together a qualitative picture uh, of 
what the school culture is like, what the school needs, what supports it's lacking, um, and that gives you an idea of how is that school doing. Um, and that's something that we could do instead of, you know, the data-driven, purely qualitative, uh, pseudo-objectivity of standardized tests. Okay. Um, brought up te test prep, and you had an interesting comment about test prep in the park. Why don't you share that? Yeah, so... Um, Into the microphone. The, uh, one of the problems with the standardized testing is the three months prior to the date of the standardized test, the teachers are mandated to spend at least 45 minutes a day practicing to take the test. Well, there has been reports, I think the Consortium of School Research issued one several years ago showing that schools in Chicago that spent this, all this time on test prep did no better mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. schools that didn't spend time on test prep but that taught. Mm -hmm. And so what you have going on is kind of a trade-off now between all of the surround of taking a standardized test, the test prep, the emphasis on those, the, the narrowing of the curriculum, teaching those things that seem to appear on the test year after year after year and not teaching other things, all of that just sort of drives the whole curriculum and shuts out all of the other things that kids need, that teachers know they should be teaching, and that uh, really enrich a kid's experience at school. It is not surprising to me that we have a lot of students being ready and willing to opt out because, you know, school is not real fun these days. And <laughs> for teachers or students, but it could be. We have very capable students, we have very capable teachers, and we're not giving kids a chance to learn or teachers a chance to teach. But can you prep for the park? And, and talk a little bit about how that so, test is different. And so then so the, the park and the Common Core standards, I have to say that there's, there's a whole now bundle of stuff that's happening, which is a kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And I want to speak to the, the standards that the Common Core introduces are really about the kinds of skills you need to be a functioning citizen in the 21st century. You need to know how to think cri critically. You need to know how to make an argument. You need to know how to critique somebody else's argument. Um, all of those things are part of what's in the Common Core. I think that it doesn't go, it's just a set of standards though. It does not tell you what students need to know in order to achieve those standards. That is the work of unpacking the standards that teachers have not had time to do, that our curriculum supervisors and, and people have not had time to do, to say, well, if a student is going to give me that performance, what do we need to teach? And what do different the students in my school need that students in somebody else's school might have? So how do we adjust uh, achieving those standards, how do we adjust our instruction to meet the needs of students so that all students can achieve these standards, which I believe they can, but it takes potentially differential kinds of instruction, but that's an analysis that teachers have not had time to happen. I just want to make one point that this is no surprise that teachers need time for this kind of implementation, but when you look at what's happened at the policy level, it has really, really, I think, thrown a monkey wrench into the whole thing. I think it has taken what could be good about this and what could be good about the park assessments because they're pretty aligned with the, the standards. They're problem solving. They're asking students to apply what they've learned how to do. And they ask them to think. I don't think anybody is necessarily against that. But it takes time. It takes time to do that, and it takes time to do instruction that teaches students to do that. It's a multi-year phenomenon. So I like the idea of grade spans for certain kinds of things. Um, there may be other things that we want to do drop-in checks on. But again, this sort of tying everything to teacher accountability, it's just it's the wrong way to go. It's just the wrong way to go. Well, um, what information should schools give the public about what's happening in a school? So, you know, I moved to town someplace. What is it I should expect to get? I mean, people look at test scores. What should they look at instead? Don't all jump in. I think uh, one of the things that, you know, at the state level we're trying to do is kind of like CPS discussed, give multiple measures. So we revamped our report card to reflect more metrics, not just the ISAT score, but graduation rates and 
um, the percent of children or students that uh, get at least a 21 on the ACT. Um, that's not to say that's the score that you all aspire to, but it's, it's one way of, of looking at how well your school is doing. The other thing that kind of speaks to the idea of um, looking at school environment is the uh, Five Essentials Survey, which is a survey of school climate and learning conditions. Um, again, it's something that teachers and students fill out, and we, Chicago has had it for many years. We made it statewide a couple years ago. So there is an effort to give a fuller picture that it is more than a score, that it is really about um, a whole bunch of uh, factors, uh, graduation rates, how, you know, leadership, um, safety, all, you know, it is, is, you know, for years we just talked about those scores. Um, you know, as long as I've been at the state board, that's the number one story that reporters call me about. Um, and, and there is so much more to education that we're not discussing. How do you like those? Uh, what well, you caught my eye, so go yeah. ahead. Um, <laughs> You know, we get this question on uh, Facebook um, from parents in Raise Your Hand, uh, and something that I think everyone says is don't look at those test scores, visit the school, talk to the teachers, talk to parents, talk to students, observe what that school feels like when you walk in the door. Um, you can, if, you know, you'll see student work, hopefully you'll see student work like on the walls around, you'll see students interacting and what their school day is like. Uh, and those are the things that actually are gonna matter to your child when they're there. Um, and you know, even as a, a lay person, as a parent, um, you know whether that is a good learning environment for a child or not. Um, and really, even as we push to these multiple measure quantitative things like the five essentials, once we make those a high stakes thing, that also really warps them. You know, there's something called Campbell's Law. As soon as you attach this importance to the social science uh, indicator, it suddenly becomes warped. And we know now that, you know, with the My School, My Voice survey, principals tell their staff and their students and their families, this is gonna matter for our school rating. Don't be honest, give us a good rating. I mean, that's just rational, that is a rational thing. And unfortunately, if you looked at the five essential surveys before it became high stakes, it probably was more interesting than it is now. So, um, but are there enough of those other measures I mean, you can't sort of game all of them. Is there enough out there to, or maybe you can, I don't know. <laughs> uh, once you attach high stakes, people will find a way to game them. And I think you just can't get away with, you know, visible evidence going in and visiting a school. So what should have high stakes, if not tests? Um, I think we should have higher uh, stakes on our elected officials who are providing uh, <laughs> Deciding, you know, how our schools are resourced, deciding how equitable our public education system is, and truly looking uh, if every child is getting what the most uh, wealthy families in our state are providing for their children. And what those families are providing for the children are not standardized tasks. Go ahead. So, uh, you know, I've heard the comment from uh, both people that have spoken on this issue. It's like, don't look at the scores. Don't just look at the scores. Can you picture how everybody is just looking at the scores? Isn't that a sad state of affairs where we actually have to go and tell people that is not the whole picture? There is more to it than just the score, right? So what would I do to, te to show my school to, to, to parents? Um, we, we, so right now we're getting ready to have our sixth graders come up to middle school and we're talking about bringing our parents into the school and telling them all the things that we do. Not the scores, you know, that, I mean, it, it, it'll come up, they'll ask. But uh, that is now our, our focus. So we're gonna tell them how we have um, uh, conservation programs that take our kids to the river and they have, they, 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 they have them do restoration work. Um, We'll, we'll have um, a science expo day. So there is other activities. There's gonna be a science expo day. We invite the community, we invite our parents to participate with us, with us on that. So have them be there during 
the activities that show the real learning of kids. Look, standardized tests assume that kids are a standard, that they, there is that there is a mold for kids when they are about to come out, and then every kid gets molded the same and brought gets brought in. Um, there is no standard kid ever whatsoever. So what happens is that um, with standardized testing, all of my creative kids get left behind, and all of my alternative thinkers get left behind. Um, that's just unfair to those kids. Uh, the best aspect of a school is the school itself. So parents uh, uh, visit the school. Um, I, I find also a little bit disturbing that we have to have parents go and measure a school against another school. I think we have to put it on our politicians, our public leaders, to make, to, to, to make it happen so that there is a system in which all the schools are good. And then the only thing you are going to worry about the only thing you should worry about is, you know, which one is the furthest away from your house. Yeah. Um, how would you decide which kids get to go into those selective enrollment schools, if you have them? There, sh there shouldn't be selective enrollment schools. All of them should be selective enrollment schools. Let's do it the Finland way. Go ahead, you wanna jump in? So I think that I wanna, I wanna just say that we need to, to balance, we need to spend less money putting money into Pearson's pocket and more money locally. And, and, help, and so, so to create a better balance, we need to actually rebalance the system between large scale accountability and assessments that are close to the classroom, close to the teacher, close to the student, and close to the learning that's going on. I think the way you can tell something about the quality of the education is to say, well, to a teacher, how do you know how well my student is doing? And if a teacher can pull out work the student has done and say, this is a really good piece of work because, and share with the parent the criteria that they're using, right? That's important because that tells the parent what their child is engaged in intellectually, emotionally, psychologically, and the climate that the teacher knows the student. Now admittedly, at high school level, it gets a little harder when you've got 150, but we also need to think about the way we're structuring the workday for teachers. Almost every country that outscores us on international tests treats their teachers much differently than we do. Mm -hmm. The workplace... The workplace is a learning environment for teachers, principals, curriculum people, and students, but we don't engage teachers that way in our schools. And we need to. Okay. They need time to learn, learn about their kids, learn about new methods, instruction, et cetera. And we just, it's not part of their work day, okay. but it needs to be. All right, now it's time for you all to ask questions. Um, uh, stand up, we have one or two people with a microphone who's gonna move around. You can tweet us questions and comments. The hashtag is the school project and another hashtag, hashtag testing season. Um, oh, yeah. So I'm turning it, turning it over to my colleagues out in the audience. Do you wanna start over here? Sure, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm um, gonna be reading some questions from Twitter and Facebook. So if you're shy, feel free to post um, any questions you have there. Um, so, the first question I have is from a special ed teacher. Um, her name's Katie Osgood. And she listed a, a bunch of different um, uh, instances in which her kids had become extremely stressed out by testing, that they were pulling out their eyelashes, that they were showing extreme levels of um, being disrupted by the whole process. Um, so she just wanted to know, you know, is it worth it to put kids through that? It, yeah, I think the panel has sort of already said no. I don't know if anything you can do around the testing yeah. to make it yeah. less stressful. But I mean, I think having been a former classroom teacher and, and, and even a student and all of us up here and, you know, in the audience have gone through, whether it's high school, college, and, and onward, um, testing isn't 
it, the, the idea of sitting down and taking a test, like when I took my test to become a teacher or when I took the test to become a principal or you know, someone takes a test to become a doctor, it's a very stressful event. It's like the time to show what you know. Um, and I have found that the more the experiences that lead up to that prepare me for that, help me to build confidence, help me to you know, be exposed to the types of you know, um, you know, ways that I might have to demonstrate my learning, the, the more the anxiety kind of drops, right? And so I think that's a very unfortunate um, thing to hear about, and it challenges us to think about how are we preparing children and exposing them to you know, experiences that are embedded within their learning environment that helps them to be more confident and, and have more of an ease in showing what they know and showing what they've mastered. It's gonna be a part of college, it's a part of getting into you know, different certifications and organizations. And you know, that is, it is when we think about preparing students for college, career, and life, that's a component of it. It's one that we've all experienced. And so you know, we don't wanna see that happen. And I think if it's too much testing or if there's, you know, there, there's a root cause to that problem and really trying to find a way to solve that. I mean, I think I would say on that that the root cause is that we're using this testing inappropriately and we are clearly transferring the stress that adults feel down to children. Um, there's many children who it's absolutely completely inappropriate to expose to these tests. Uh, and I think more and more there actually is a path to adulthood that does not involve these tests at all. 800 colleges and universities do not require standardized tests for admissions. Um, and these are some of the best, you know, strongest places in the country to go. So I would certainly tell students who, you know, suffer from test anxiety that, you know, you do actually have a route to adulthood uh, that does not involve that. And also there's no evidence that submit, you know, uh, subjecting children to painful things that they will be subjected to as an adult strengthens them uh, for, to prepare for that. And in fact, you know, really, I, I think nurturing children is actually the way to make them strong adults and protecting them from the worst of things. You know, stress actually does very bad things to children's brains. Okay, thank you. Out to the audience. Okay, I have a question and that is, uh, what criterion is used to determine what tests to use, and how is validity and re reliability in these tests verified? So it's who decides, who and how decides. do they decide what the tests are? Right. We know that certain uh, publishing houses have a monopoly on producing tests, but how does the state or CPS go about uh, choosing a particular or several different standardized tests and what is the reliability and the validity behind these tests? Mira, do you wanna go first and then Dahlia? Well, with uh, PARC, we had two choices, PARC or Smarter Balance. Those were the two tests that were designed from the ground up to measure learning according to the new standards. So we chose PARC. I don't know why we chose it over Smarter Balance. Um, we're one of 12 states that are testing with a PARC this uh, spring, five million students. Um, it's sort of answering a lot of the complaints we heard on the video and that we're voicing here. It's a more engaging test. It tests critical thinking. There's writing at every grade level. We didn't have that before. Um, and it, it should be a case where students feel like it does reflect what they're doing in the classroom. It, it's designed to, to reflect what goes on in the classroom. So the students that said, this is nothing like my classroom experience, hopefully that won't be the case with PARC, that they are being exposed to exercises and discussions in the classroom and they're debating and they're um, engaged and, and that the test feels the same, that it, it, it's very similar. Um, what about CPS? So you've spoke to